Hello and welcome to From Concept to Concert with the Hamilton Philharmonic Orchestra. My name is Abigail Richardson Schulte and I'm composer in residence with the HPO. We have a great show coming up called Come Together, HPO Performs the Beatles, and I'm joined by our guest conductor and arranger Darcy Hefner. Welcome, Darcy. Thanks, Abigail. It's really exciting for me to be doing this uh, concert again with the HPO. This will be our third round, our fourth concert, but our third round of doing a Beatles show gets more interesting every time. Absolutely. And and tell us, how did this idea come together with you conducting all of this Beatles rep at the HPO? How did it come together? Well, of yeah. course, it started in 2017 when we did the first one. So if you want to go back, uh, I did a concert with the HPO with Ian Thomas. Uh, and so it was Ian's music, and Ian and I and a couple of other people had arranged his music for the orchestra. And Carol Kehoe was the CEO at the time. And after the Ian, Ian show, uh, she said, let's meet for coffee. So we went to our, the place where she met for coffee on uh, Lock Street. And she said, what would you like to do next? And I said, <laughs> how about a Beatles show? She ah, said, great, let's go. do it. Okay. So... And I always uh, was one of the shows that I, I always kind of wanted to do for some reason. Well, I played uh, the Broadway show Beatlemania when it, you know, a while back. And I found it so intriguing how they had approached recreating the music. You know, now you can watch it in video and you realize we're actually doing a better job now than they did. But, um, but at the time, nobody had done it before. So it was remarkable to hear all of those songs. And of course, the guys dressed up in the suits and had wigs and kind of looked like the Beatles, although, you know, in person, there was like an Italian guy, and a, you know, they didn't like without the wigs and stuff, except for the guy who played Paul, which was a character of Paul, a really nice guy, we're still friends, but, uh, uh, so it started that way, and so that was the first show, and I just, uh, I remember at the time just saying, Carol, I just need at least a year to prep it, because it was a lot of music, so that, I had a little over a year to pull all of that, and that became kind of the foundation for the show that we're doing now because a lot of that was the music that involved orchestra and, you know, that kind of support, which is what we were trying to do. We're trying to bring the orchestra forward in this. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, now, speaking of that, I mean, you say it takes a year. It is a huge amount of work to do these arrangements. Just so everybody's clear, uh, maybe you can explain a bit about what it takes, uh, your process. How do you go from listening to a Beatles tune to then trying to recreate it for a singer or singers and rock band on stage and orchestra? I'm getting a headache just hearing all of that. <laughs> uh, excuse me. Um, well, first I have to choose the song because you have to look at the set and say, what will make the most sense? What will flow? And fortunately, after our last concert in 2019, a friend of mine's wife in the audience recorded the concert on her iPhone. I had no other documentation of the show, but she recorded it mono because <clears throat> it was long. Oh, it was the Friday. So remember, we did one set on the first night. It was just okay. one set the first J Just for our audience watching, you're not allowed to do that. Now, you can get away with this because of <laughs> who you are in this is, but don't come to the HBO and record it all on your iPhone. <laughs> well, generally. I didn't do it. I didn't but even no, know But no, no, I know. But so that, that's your documentation. Yeah. Yeah. So, so two years later, uh, oh, by the way, my wife, oh, I'd love to hear that, you know. So uh, he sent it to me. And when I, uh, I, I go for walks a lot and, and during... Uh, you know, our lockdown, intense lockdown period, I was taking a winter stroll in the evening and I just said, hey, Siri, play some Beatles. And it played that show. So I forgot it. I forgot it was even on my phone. So I started to listen to it and I started to get a different sense of, uh, I got a sense of the flow from an audience perspective and it changed uh, my concept for this show. Oh. So Interesting. I liked, How so? Yeah. Well, I felt that there, you know, there's a fine line between supporting, presenting the orchestra in, a, in its best possible light and providing a show that can completely engage the audience. And so, and in the Beatles music, if, if I, if you recall, we would, the, the band started with a paperback writer and then immediately we went into lower key stuff because a lot of this their early part of the show was yesterday and fool on the hill 
So I realized I had to look at the slope of the concert again and reevaluate where how I wanted people to feel about getting connected to the actual band, which if you've seen the set list, you know there's more band stuff off, off the top this time. Because in the early years, which there were no strings really, not until, until yesterday really, uh, and that was a little later on, and that was actually a Paul McCartney song, and no other Beatles were on it. So that's an int- that was something they had to you know wrap their head around at the time. But I wanted to bring that excitement to lift the concert at the start, so that the rest of it would have more perspective. So this time mm-hmm. around, we have more band pieces, and uh, although they're not uncomplex, I like to challenge the guys in the band. So. Uh, but I do write out everything, so <laughs> I understand what that question you asked had like had so many levels to it. Uh, so picking the songs is the shape of the show, but making sure that the orchestra gets presence and visibility. So I wrote uh, an orchestral arrangement for Helter Skelter, which you know is, is a pretty kind of crazy tune anyway. And uh, they say that's the birth of heavy metal, which it might be. But, you know, George apparently was running around the studio with an ashtray, you know, with flames coming out of it, with an ashtray on his head. (laughs) And, you know, so they were having a good time. And then what I noticed the last time is that people do want to sing along. I mean, they did the first time, too. And I remembered with uh, Beatlemania, people knew the words to every song and they wanted to engage. So this show, I wanted to try to invite the audience in a bit more perhaps than I had in the past. So once you choose the song, then you decide, is this going to be an orchestra strong song or is it going to be a band song? Like I also did an orchestral arrangement for, uh, uh, well, my guitar gently weeps. So in that case, I thought, no, this is going to be a both song. You know, I'm going to bring orchestra into this. And in that one, the band starts and you put, traditional way and then the band cuts out and the orchestra finishes it so and so in this one though uh yeah it's just a whole different story because okay, so, you, is not, so, so you have I, some new numbers for this year then oh yeah i have a, a few and and uh-huh. and this time i've done things that i didn't do in the past i did uh well yellow submarine i can tell you here uh that you know, I first of all I told you that I took the Yellow Submarine band part and that, that corrected it because uh, it was just a spliced in band from the library, brass band from the library. So the harmony in the brass band splice doesn't match the harmony the Beatles were playing in Yellow Submarine. It's close, but the Beatles go to the five chord and the band didn't. So, mm-hmm. so sorry, uh, how do you get this? Just to be clear, you just listen to the songs and sort of then go back and listen again and and try to just take it down by ear. Is that how you do this? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, I, I well I have a pretty good program. It's called Transcribe. It allows you to slow it down. And so I drop the, the track into Transcribe, and then I actually I can listen to it around seventy instead of a hundred, and I listen to the whole thing, and then you hear more detail. And I use FLAC files. Okay. I bought. Um, I guess you don't need to see it, but uh, actually it's cool. I'm going to show it to you. <laughs> I bought this. This is a. Where is my camera? <laughs> this is a Beatles thumb drive. And it came in this little apple. And there's the thumb drive. So on this app, on this little apple, is the highest possible resolution files you can get for any Beatles song. Mm. So I wanted that because I wanted to be able to hear the detail. So I found that thumb drive and then I drag the FLAC file in, which is lossless, into the transcribe program, and I get incredible detail. So then I can slow that down to 70 and give the track a listen and see what kind of problem it's going to cause for me. And then I've been collecting Beatles tracks for a long time, so I also have a lot of them with no vocals. So when I did the arrangement for uh, the, the, you never give your, give me your money, you know, the, the last the end, all of that stuff. At the end, the, last, the three tracks at Abbey Road, at the end of Abbey Road, I have with no vocals, which allowed me to hear strings and brass that I couldn't hear because the voices were covering them. So I got more detail. Uh huh. And, yeah. and for some reason, and the reason was, is because we can't match John and Paul's voice or George's voice. That's 
we can do a lot with accompaniment that is very authentic, but we can't get the voices. And I had an experience playing a tribute show, let's say, to Ray Charles. And in that show, I noticed that never at any time did it feel like Ray was in the room. And so there has to be a sense of authenticity somewhere in there so that you can feel like there's a spirit of that that, that has come into the room with you. And that I wanted that to happen. So the only way I could really get that, I felt, was to take the time and get really into the detail of music so that it would feel authentic mm-hmm. rather than doing something that's close. And uh, that's my bad because I sometimes get very involved in listening to a viola line, you know, just to make sure I've got every viola note, you know, because you can hear right. the difference. So, um, so just to make sure that it's really accurate. Yeah. So I wanted that authenticity in the program. So that that's part of the transcription process for me. There is, uh, and we've discussed this before, the white book, which says it's every note that the Beatles ever played. But I, I can happily randomly show you examples of how that is so far from the case. And I don't use it at all, but it's also because I grew up transcribing as a jazz saxophone player. Uh, I so see. transcription I... is not a new process for me at all. Right. And but I mean, tra- a... sorry, I mean, tra- transcription with the, the studio albums, that's an entirely different thing altogether, right? <laughs> I mean, yeah. my goodness. So I think you really have to use a lot of imagination. Um, well, and, it's not uh... just that. I, I do have, <laughs> I do have this book. This is a fantastic book. Bill Dillon calls this the T-H-E book. I don't know if you can see this. It's called Recording the Beatles. It's yeah. massive. It's actually shipped in a, uh, a facsimile of an Abbey Road tape box. And <laughs> it fun. details, I, I, I get really excited about this stuff, obviously. But if you look at the track, it'll actually show you where the lads were standing in the room when they recorded mm. the track, what microphones they used, how they approached the overdubs, what the instrumentation was. Mm-hmm. So if I can get the instrumentation, I'm ahead of the game. The problem with, for example, Pepperland, the thing we open with from Yellow Submarine, is there's no documented instrumentation on it anywhere. So I didn't really, I mean, you can hear what they're using, but I don't know how many of anything. Mm-hmm. So that was just my best guess. And my best guess have changed a lot since 2017. Like the mm-hmm. process for me is way different. We're doing a show at the Westdale on the 27th, just a, a you know, with the string quartet and some of the singers that are going to be doing the show. And one of the songs that I chose for that, not thinking it through, was Eleanor Rigby. I thought, oh, string quartet, Eleanor Makes Rigby. Makes sense. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it would, except that Eleanor Rigby was written for a double string quartet, which Octet, I forgot yeah. about. <laughs> yeah. So I had to go through and revoice the entire thing for a quartet. Mm-hmm. So doing that, I discovered that I wanted to make improvements on my double, my octet version because okay. I felt I found an inner viola line I wasn't happy. You know, it's like these little details that nobody but me is probably going to hear and notice. And, and then, of course, notation. I'm now better, a lot better at, at notating slurry, straight, you know, the, the gloopy strings like the Beatles do uh, that George Martin would write for them. I'm a lot better at notating that so I get back what, what I want to hear. Uh-huh. So that's okay. changed. And, you know, so, again, it's authenticity and detail. All right, so you could, are... You are tweaking some things then after the last show, for example, like uh, learning as you go. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, I don't. I, I do tweak, but I'm not going to update everything because I don't want them printing the entire book again. Yeah, and there you are know, something so. like thirty songs in this. I mean, one oh. of my questions was going to be to you: How do you decide where where these uh, songs go and and who plays what? And you've already addressed that uh, a little bit in, in a bit of a shakeup this year and a feature on the band, which is interesting. But um, perhaps you can speak for a moment on the guests that you're having on stage and how you decide who sings what. Well. Just to go back to the 30 songs, one of the most difficult things about that is to choose which ones you will not play. <laughs> you know, if it was up to me, the show would be three and a half hours long, or we would do right. it every night for a week and do something different every night. <laughs> because there's so much in that canon of, that is, you know, that should be played and we could have so much fun with. Yeah. Uh, but how we 
choose the players, the singers. Often I ask them what they're comfortable with. And yeah, that that's typically or I or and my HR technique usually involves being very familiar with how each of the singers sing. So when I hear the melody, I think this is perfect for this guy. For example, uh, when I'm 64, will be sung this time by Thompson Wilson, who is young enough to sing it. Hmm. You know, you know, I, Ian can, as Ian said, maybe somebody who's younger than me should be singing when I'm 64. Uh, <laughs> yeah. And so Thompson is on that. I don't know if he knows it yet. Thompson, if you see this, you're singing uh, when I'm 64. <laughs> uh, uh, he's a busy guy. And who else have you got on? Well, Jamie Oaks. Jamie can do anything. Uh, Jamie has uh, got a wonderful dramatic presence, too. He brings, I always managed to find something really unique and extra to bring to the table with him. So I, he's a, a real treasure. And he's, all these guys live pretty close to my house here. So that's also nice that way. They can come up for, this is how it works. Everybody who, who sings on it comes over for coffee and we talk about the tunes and we listen together. And what do you think about this one? So uh, nothing is arbitrary about it. I just, I make sure everybody is happy and you try to make sure that everybody is, has a balanced repertoire and you don't freak somebody out by saying, oh, by the way, you're going to sing Helter Skelter. Uh, Cause that takes a, a certain kind of voice also. Uh -huh. uh, but yeah, so it's, it's a very, very democratic process. Okay, and and so uh, in terms of putting this together, I mean, we we the way orchestras work is that you don't have much orchestra rehearsal. Everybody comes completely prepared and just puts it together. So, do you get right. together with the band, I guess, at your place and and uh, oh, no, rehearse, we, we... and then you're ready to just sync up with the orchestra? Well, that, yeah, in theory, that's right. No, but we I actually go to a rehearsal space, and we have at least three rehearsals with the singers, three rehearsals with the band, and we have our dress rehearsal just before we meet the orchestra. So we have, we, my goal is the band is done. It has no issues and now it's ready to bring what it does to the orchestra. So it's a complex process. I've sent, I've spent most of this week sending out music to singers, drummers, bass players, key, and well, everybody. Yeah. Updated music or new songs. Of, so, you know, sending out PDFs of all the new music that I'm adding to the show. So they yeah. all have time to look at it. And they're also requesting it, you know, if I haven't got it fast enough, where's my music? Right. And so, I mean, so I as, have... as a ranger, you have to sort of be uh, orchestra librarian as well in, in a certain way, right? So, um, and, and aside from being conductor and arranger, you know, like we say here, you're sort of the go-between between the band and the orchestra. Uh, so here we are several weeks out from the concert. Can you give us an idea of what uh, a day in the life is like with you right now? Well, I get up and I do Beatles until about <laughs> five o'clock. And then I, 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 I have, I'm a, you know, I play the flute and I play the saxophone for a little while. Then I make dinner and I probably do a little Beatles. And now I play a little more saxophone. Okay. All Beatles <laughs> all the time. Well, it is, but you know, cause uh, I'm working on, an arrangement for something and then I get an email or we need a bio or mm. can you send me parts and yeah. so yeah just get on it and keep keep the ball rolling you know it's a it's intense I'm I'm definitely I would go between this and I sort of feel like there's so many moving parts to something of this size and I just have to make sure they're always moving basically so and then sounds I have, good yeah yeah, and I have this, you know, I have the vocalist covered, and and I'm feeling comfortable with it. I and when I'm feeling comfortable with everything, then I know, then I know that I'm, I'm on, and I'm almost there. Right. Well, third time uh, through, you know exactly what you're facing. So, uh, and you know the people you're working with well. So, I expect this yeah. this will be great. This will be great. Now, my last question for you is, what do you love about doing this Beatles show? Well, at first, I didn't love anything about it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I'm talking about this particular round because I, I knew more than anything that it was a lot of work. And But once I started to work on it and the music and the musicians, I started to remember how much fun it is and how much joy there is in the music and that people get from here getting to hear it and, and view it. And when I asked Ian Thomas if he wanted to join us this time, 
he thought for a minute, he said, well, it was so much fun. Mm -hmm. And that's really what it comes down to. We have a great time with the music. I, I take a few liberties. I added, uh, this time I, I, I did, I was a little cheeky. I wasn't as cheeky as I could have been, but at the very end of Yellow Submarine, and, and you'd have to be a real connoisseur to hear it, but I, I flew in the brass from Sergeant Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club and then manipulated it to fit the harmony. So it has a Beatles vibe, but you won't go, that's Pepper. You'll just go, oh, that seems to fit. And I did that because of the marching band thing in the middle. I thought, okay, well, let's end with it moving into that direction. We're not doing uh, For No One this time, which is a great song. But it has, and it has that beautiful French horn part, the solo, beautiful French horn solo in it. And I felt a little bit badly that we couldn't use that solo. So it's now played by three trumpets in Hello Goodbye. And the really cheeky part that I didn't add was, although I have a score with it in, but I chose not to use it, is Tears for Fears did a song called Sowing the Seeds of Love. And it's a great song, and it's Beatle influenced in the chorus, Sowing the Seeds of Love. They basically stole the chord changes from Hello Goodbye. So I flew it into Hello Goodbye. It works perfectly. And I could have the, the, the girls, the, ba the background singers, singing that against the rest of it. And it would sound perfect, but it would be distracting. So I, I had to vote that one off the island, but, <laughs> uh, but it was, uh, it was on my mind for a minute, but I didn't do that in the past. In the past, I've tried to stay very true to the original, but this time around, I'm having a little fun pulling, you know, things in from different places. Sounds good. I have no doubt that it will be a really fun show. So thank you for joining me, Darcy, and we hope that all of you watching will join us on February 11th for Come Together. We'll see you there. Beautiful. Thank you. Abby.